Hey, everybody, and welcome to the show. If this is your first time... It's always somebody's first time. That is true. It's always someone's first time, and you love those cherries. Yes, I do. Guilty as charged. If this is your first time, I'm T.C. Rollins. And I am Rain DeGray. And if you haven't figured it out already, this episode is about masturbation. A subject we are both extremely passionate about. That is true. But we do need to give you this warning that just by listening to this episode could jeopardize your mortal soul. And also be aware that just listening to this could be illegal in some places. All the fun things are illegal. They are. But if this isn't your first time, welcome back. You know who we are. You know what we do. So enjoy the show. Now, children, settle down. We have some very important things to discuss today. Okay. All right. Oh, Mr. Gray. Fine. As you are all no doubt aware, your bodies have been undergoing some changes lately. <laughs> These changes that you're feeling are perfectly natural and nothing to be concerned about. Now, we're going to be watching this film that the State Board of Education has determined is the best way to teach you about self-stimulation. What's that, Mr. Gray? Uh, well, self-pleasure. Have any of you heard of masturbation? Master what in? Y you know, <clears throat> um, flicking the bean? Huh? Beating the bishop? What? Uh, choking the chicken? Giving yourself a, a hand? Buffing the muffin? Um, what? Um, huh? Burping the worm? Paddling the pink canoe, shaking hands with the milkman, petting the cat. Uh... It, tell you what, why don't we watch this short film to get a better idea of the topic at hand, and I will answer any questions afterwards. Owen Chastity Products, the country's leader in genital cages, virtue belts, spiked glands rings, and penile studs, is proud to present The Trouble with Masturbation. Dad? Yes, Billy? Come on in. What is it, son? Well, Dad, lately at night, I'll be in my bed and I'll start getting this funny feeling. You know, down there. You mean your penis, Billy? Yeah. Does it hurt? No. It feels good. I, I keep wanting to touch it and rub it, and I do for a little bit, but then after a while it starts feeling almost like I have to pee real bad, so, so I stop, because I don't want to pee in the bed again and make you angry, but I don't want to stop because it feels so good. Do you ever feel this way? Yes, Billy. Every man has gone through the exact same thing as you have at least once in his life. Have you ever heard of masturbation or onanism? No. Well, that doesn't matter. The most important thing you need to remember when you start feeling these urges is that it's just Satan whispering in your ear, trying to corrupt your soul. Oh. You see, Billy, God is watching you all the time. 
But he starts watching you extra closely when you start touching yourself down there. He's got a keen interest in what happens when people start fondling the parts of their bodies that we cover with our bathing suits. If you get any pleasure out of touching those parts of your body, outside of the act of procreation, and even then, only if you're a man, it may ruin any chance of your ever getting into heaven. What you're doing is a sin, not just that, it's an unforgivable, unnatural sin. Like Bishop Augustine of Hippo said, the sin of masturbation is worse than the sins of fornication, rape, incest, or adultery, because at least those can lead to pregnancy. There's only one place where people that do what you've been doing at night go, and that's straight to the fiery gates, Billy. Uh, uh, I don't want to go to hell. And it's not just that, Billy. If you keep doing it, you'll be driving a race car right to the devil's front porch. Because if you keep giving in to these temptations, your body will start to waste away and you'll soon die from every heinous condition imaginable. But I don't want to die and go to hell. <laughs> That's why we have to nip this thing in the bud right here and now. I need you to know what kind of dangerous cliff you're dangling your toes over. It's important you take this seriously. I, I will. I promise. You see that big leather book on the shelf over there? Bring it to me. This one? Yes, that's the one. Bring it here. Now, listen closely, because I'm going to read you a first-hand account by Samuel Auguste Tissot. He was a physician that dealt with chronic masturbators. I went to his home. What I found, I found was a living being and a cadaver lying on straw. Thin, pale, exuding a loathsome stench, almost incapable of movement. A pale and watery blood often dripped from his nose. He drooled continually. Subject to attacks of diarrhea, he defecated in his bed without noticing it. There was a constant flow of semen. His eyes, sticky, blurry, and dull, had lost all power of movement. His pulse was extremely weak and racing. Labored respiration, extreme emaciation, except for the feet which were showing signs of edema. Mental disorder was equally evident. Without ideas, without memory, incapable of linking two sentences, without reflection, without fear of his fate, lacking all feeling except of pain, which returned at least every three days with each new attack. Thus sunk below the level of the beast, a spectacle of unimaginable horror. It was difficult to believe that he had once belonged to the human race. He died after several weeks, his entire body covered in edemas. Is that what you want, Billy? Is that the kind of life you want to live? No! Stop! I, I, I'll stop, I promise! Damn it! I told your mother we should have circumcised you to keep this from happening. Go get your coat, Billy. I need to take you somewhere. Where are we going? Somewhere I should have taken you a long time ago. There's a wax museum just outside of town that has detailed, lifelike statues that illustrate the grossly deformed bodies of masturbators. I want you to see with your own eyes what horrible fate awaits you if you continue down this path. We need to extract from your heart the abominable pus of this foul sin. Now go get your coat, and I'll bring the car around. <laughs> Well, that's enough of that. I don't know why the school board insists on showing you these films. You know what, class? That was a bunch of bullshit. 
It is time for some truths, and I am a truth teller. Strap yourselves in. The history of masturbation is a long and checkered one. For most of human history, we've had varying opinions on the subject, but the stigma around masturbation that we are battling in our current day is more of a recent invention than you might think. Before Christianity really took hold, masturbation was not viewed with the pearl-clutching abhorrence of the past few centuries. People were much more blasé on the subject. Even Christianity took a while to really start the anti-masturbation drumbeat. And why is that, class? Because every load dropped in a hand or the nearest sock as opposed to a fertile married Christian womb, meant one less Christian soldier for the cause. Yes, that's right. The anti-masturbation taboos we struggle with today are directly based on the Christian religion being concerned about seed being wasted and not growing up to be future Christians. A religion stops being relevant if they don't have enough active and engaged participants, and Christianity has worked hard at being the most dominant religion on this planet. Don't believe me? What year is it? What year is it all over the world? You don't get to have your religion dictate date-keeping for an entire planet without doing some serious strategy. Part of that strategy involves doing their very best to stamp out the practice of masturbation. This was done through a scare campaign that increased in intensity as the centuries went by. Mrs. DeGray? Yes, Sam? My pastor told me that the Bible says I shouldn't touch myself between my legs. Well... For everything that the Bible forbids, from shellfish to mixed fabric blends, it is surprisingly light on forbidding masturbation. The biblical story of Onan is traditionally linked to referring to masturbation, but the sexual act described is coitus interruptus, not masturbation. There is no explicit claim in the Bible that masturbation is sinful. Danny, go get the Bible out of the recycling bin where we put it the other day. Okay, Mr. Gray. Now open it to Matthew 5, 29-30. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Excellent. Now pass it over to Jen, and I'll have her read Mark nine forty two to 49. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck, and he were to cast it into the sea. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into a life maimed, than having two hands go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot 
offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet be cast into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Where their worm deep not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes be cast into hellfire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. For every one shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Very good. Please toss it back in the bin. It has been suggested that the word hand in these chapters may imply masturbation. The sinning by eye, hand, and foot may come from a tradition of formulaic warnings against lustful gazing by the eye, masturbation by hand, and adultery by foot, which is the Hebrew euphemism for genitalia. It is a bit of a stretch, but that is the closest the Bible comes to forbidding the practice of masturbation. Any other questions? No, Mr. No. Okay. Like I was saying before, for a long time, masturbation wasn't considered a major sin, just an indulgence or a minor offense. In a 7th century penitential written by Theodore of Tarsus, it counseled a penance lasting up to 50 days for the cleric who voluntarily masturbates spread in a church. 50 days might seem like a lot, but at the time, a young man touching a virgin woman would get a full year. Masturbating in a church? 50 days. Touching a virgin? A full year. There is no doubt that fingers touching a virgin counted for a whole lot more than fingers touching yourself. Like with many things, once something gets started, it accumulates momentum and becomes a force unto itself. By the 1700s, the anti-masturbation campaign had really started to pick up speed, and the next few hundred years were spent worked up into a tizzy on the subject of the solitary vice. A pamphlet published in London in 1760 titled Onania, or the heinous sin of self-pollution and all of its frightful consequences in both sexes considered with spiritual and physical advice to those who have already injured themselves by this abominable practice is what really got the ball rolling claiming that masturbation caused loss of appetite or ravenous hunger, vomiting, nausea, weakening of the organs of breathing, coughing, hoarseness, paralysis, weakening of the organ of generation to the point of impotence, lack of libido, back pain, disorders of the eye and ear, total diminution of bodily powers, paleness, thinness, pimples on the face, decline of intellectual powers, loss of memory, attacks of rage, madness, idiocy, epilepsy, fever, and finally suicide. Onanya was a huge success with over 60 editions published and being translated into several languages. The anti-masturbation frenzy had officially begun and hit full swing by the Victorian era. Do you know how they tried to keep children like you from touching themselves back then? No, no that's not right. Degree. It was recommended that boys have their trousers constructed so that the genitals could not be touched through the pockets. School children had to be seated at special desks to prevent their crossing their legs in class. And girls were forbidden from riding horses and bicycles because the sensations these activities produced were considered too similar to masturbation. And 
Do you kids enjoy cornflakes? Granola? Graham crackers? Me. Oh, yeah. yeah. I do. It might surprise you that all of these remedies were devised to keep people from giving themselves a five-fingered lap dance. It was thought that eating a bland, meatless diet would extinguish that burning desire in your pants. At least, that's what Dr. John Kellogg strongly advocated. We all know there's nothing that elicits the urge to spank the monkey quite like a big serving of steak. Dr. John Harvey Kellogg loathed the practice of masturbation so much that he recommended that children be cured of this solitary vice by bandaging or tying their hands, covering their genitals with patented cages, or sewing the foreskin shut. Additionally, circumcision without anesthesia might also break the horrendous habit. Newsflash, circumcision without anesthesia will not prevent the desire for masturbation. You heard it here first. Kellogg was not alone. The medical literature of the Times describes anti-masturbation procedures of electric shock treatment, using restraining devices like chastity belts and straitjackets, and infibulation, which is cauterization or wholesale surgical removing and sewing shut of the genitals. It is true that surgically removing the genitals does prevent masturbation much more effectively than circumcision without anesthesia. Interestingly, routine neonatal circumcision was widely adopted in the United States and the UK, at least partly because of its believed preventive effect against masturbation. Yes, the widespread practice of circumcision still practiced in the United States and the UK to this day partly comes from the belief that it would stop boys from masturbating. Medical attitudes towards masturbation began to change at the beginning of the 20th century. H. Havelock Ellis, in his seminal 1897 work, Studies in the Psychology of Sex, cheerfully named famous men of the era who masturbated and then set out to disprove each of the claimed diseases which masturbation was purportedly the cause. We reach the conclusion that in the case of moderate masturbation in healthy, well-born individuals, no seriously pernicious results necessarily follow. The normalization of masturbation was furthered by the works of Kinsey during the 1940s and 50s, most notably in the Kinsey reports, which insisted that masturbation was an instinctive behavior for both males and females, citing the results of Gallup poll surveys indicating just how common it was in the United States. Unfortunately, sometimes science takes a while to catch up with things we already know. Masturbation was considered a psychological problem all the way up until 1968, when it was removed as a diagnosable condition in the DSM-2. However, the American Medical Association didn't get around to declaring masturbation as normal until 1972. That's right, class. It is perfectly normal. As long as you don't do it in public and force others to watch. Now, does anyone have any more questions? This is DeGray? Yes? You still haven't told us what masturbation even is. Oh, well, it's when you stimulate your genitals for sexual pleasure. Sometimes, but not always to orgasm. What's orgasm mean, Mrs. DeGray? You know what? We'll cover that tomorrow. Class dismissed. Fine. Oh, yeah. Yay! And now, a word from our sponsor. Previously, on Dirty Talk After, After Hours. Hours. 
Yeah, you ready for this final volley? I'm ready. All right, let's, let's do, do it. All right, hunker down. Oh shit! It looks like they're regrouping. Ah! What are they doing over there? Oh crap! Ah! Incoming! Incoming! Ah! After Hours, available exclusively on Patreon every Monday morning. Hey everybody, this is Chris. And Rain. And if you do want to join us for the Dirty Talk After Hours podcast, we would love to have you along. It's a weekly podcast that we do on Patreon. Go to patreon.com backslash dirty talk podcast and we'll give you an earful each and every Monday morning. Both of your ears full. Yes. Two ears full every Monday morning. Sometimes we go on adventures. Sometimes we talk about the weird news of the day. It's a never ending party, my friends. Join (laughs) us. So if you want to support this podcast and encourage us to keep doing the awesome job we're doing and get bonus episodes every week, go to patreon.com backslash duty talk podcast. See you all there. While we have spent the first part of this episode looking at why people's fear and the stigma surrounding masturbation is misplaced, there are times when masturbation can go horribly wrong. How wrong, you may ask? How wrong? Thank you for asking. Horribly wrong. Welcome to Masturbation Mistakes! Everybody likes saving money, right? It is perfectly understandable. However, a desire for sweet savings should not be applied to sex toys, a lesson a 27-year-old man found out the hard way when he decided to use a plastic bottle as a DIY sex toy cock ring. The bottle became stuck on his shaft, causing distal edemia a rapid accumulation of blood in his shaft that made his shame stick swell to twice its usual erect girth, according to a report in the Indian Journal of Surgery. Luckily, his penis returned to normal size after doctors cut the bottle away. Hopefully, he will think twice before deciding to give his next drink an inside hug. The money spent on proper sex toys is an investment well worth it and usually a saved ER trip. 
We mean it when we say only use proper sex toys. Not one, but two different men decided that feeding stiff electrical wire into the mouth of Mr. Happy while masturbating was a good idea. It was not a good idea. One of the men pushed the wire down so far it coiled into his bladder. Doctors had to perform surgery to remove the wire in both cases. Thankfully, the individuals ended up making a full recovery, but let this be a warning to keep the wire out of your masturbation routine. After two days of vomiting, fever, scrotum swelling, and muscle pain, a 29-year-old man decided to visit the ER. Doctors ended up diagnosing him with Fournier's gangrene, a rare type of microbial infection. The reason this man had acquired such a rare form of gangrene? He had masturbated so frequently he had opened up abrasions on the shaft of his penis, which left him vulnerable to infection. Doctors treated him with antibiotics and several rounds of skin grafting surgery. Do not beat the bishop to the point of needing skin grafts. Skin grafts are expensive and get in the way of your masturbation schedule. Pace yourself. Moderation in all things, including masturbation. A comprehensive review study in the journal Trauma and Acute Care found out that 60% of penile fracture injuries happen while men are masturbating. The most common cause for all of this broken dick? Angulation and manual compression. Fancy doctor words for squeezing too hard and stroking down at the wrong angle, causing a rupture of the corpus cavernosa, the cylindrical tubes that fill with blood when you have an erection, swelling and leaking, as well as a dozen other complications, can cause permanent loss of function, although typically the condition is fixable, which looks like multiple doctor's visits that again severely cut into one's masturbation schedule. Continue to pace yourself and apply moderation to that masturbation. Speaking of broken dick, according to various case studies detailed in the Canadian Urological Association Journal, multiple men have broken their penises while masturbating in moving cars. The vehicles stopping suddenly caused a collision between the penis and the steering wheel or the dashboard, much like a scene out of Ballard's crash. There is a time and place for masturbation. While you are operating a moving vehicle is neither the time nor the place, but probably explains why all of those vehicles stopped so suddenly. By all means, continue to give yourself a hand. It is one of the best forms of stress relief out there. Just do it safely so you don't end up in masturbation mistake.
Alex. <laughs> While all those are terrifying outcomes, there is a very real problem with masturbation. Oh yeah? What's that? Well, it's not that some men masturbate in a tight-gripped, vigorous way and train their dicks to only ejaculate under these conditions, leading to the inability to orgasm through intercourse. Because this issue can be broken by more masturbation, but in a less aggressive way. And the problem isn't because by masturbating you'll impregnate your hand in the afterlife, as claimed by Muslim televangelist Mukahid Sihad Han. Yes, some religions, negative views, and shaming of masturbation is a detriment to society and causes unneeded guilt and anxiety around the act, it's unfortunate that more modern religions don't take a positive view on masturbation like the Egyptians did. They believed that the god Adam masturbated the world into existence, creating other gods and the waters of the Nile with his ejaculation. This is why it was necessary for the pharaoh to masturbate into the river every year to ensure that it kept flowing. Religion is a problem, but it's not the problem. It's definitely not that it causes health issues, unless you have an anterior venous malformation, which can sometimes result in a brain hemorrhage while masturbating, or if you suffer from post-orgasmic illness syndrome, a condition that causes the individual to become ill immediately following ejaculation, if anything, playing with yourself has a lot of healthy benefits. It decreases your cortisol levels, the hormone that's related to stress, while simultaneously releasing dopamine, endorphins, and oxytocin, all of which can elevate your mood, help you relax and fall asleep, or increase your focus and concentration. One study conducted in Germany also found that it might increase immune function. They tested their subjects' blood 45 minutes after ejaculation and found that they had elevated white blood cell counts compared to the pre-masturbation levels. There is even some evidence that regular masturbation might reduce the risk of prostate cancer, but it's not conclusive. Its health benefits are so well known that back in 2009, the British NHS produced a pamphlet for teenagers with a heading that announced... An orgasm a day keeps the doctor away. It went on to say that regular sex is good for cardiovascular health. So, no, the problem isn't that it's detrimental to your health in any way. Nor is the problem with masturbation that some people engage in it compulsively. Anything that delivers a reward hit of dopamine can cause people to form a habit. Whether it's exercising or shooting heroin, the possibility of addiction is always present. It doesn't matter how frequently you masturbate, as long as it's not negatively affecting your work, your relationships, your finances, or your physical health. You can rub one out all day long without any fear of ill effects. In fact, a German study from 1969 had men masturbate every few hours over a period of two years and found no evidence of physical or mental disease or disorder. Some people are afraid that masturbation can lead to infertility or low sperm counts. The argument is that frequent masturbation will waste the sperm needed for insemination, and when procreative copulation occurs, the sperm reserves will be depleted, leading to a lower chance of conception. So if a couple is trying to get pregnant, all available sperm is needed and no extracurricular handiwork should be taking place. As it turns out, regular masturbation might have an evolutionary benefit and lead to a higher chance of fertilization. Yes, the volume of ejaculate increases the greater the time between orgasms, 
but the quality of the semen decreases. Back in the late 80s, two scientists conducted a study to determine how long sperm remained in their peak physical form. They argued that their mobility began to degrade over a few days after their creation and were only good for about five to seven days. Since the testes operate on a first-in, first-out system, the longer the time between emissions, the older and less mobile the sperm would be. To test this theory, they collected the postcoital flowback from around 30 couples. What they found, after compensating for the different amount of volume, depending on how long it had been since last ejaculation, was that more sperm was retained inside the body and wasn't ejected with the flowback the shorter the time period between masturbation and copulation. This they attributed to the better swimming abilities of the younger, healthier sperm. So if you're trying to get pregnant, it might help to beat the meat even more and clean the pipes, as they say. Therefore, infertility is definitely not the problem with masturbation. Then what is it? Is there really a problem with masturbation? It seems like it's really good for you. The problem with masturbation is masturbation. What? The word masturbation is the problem with the act. Huh? If you look at the etymology of the word masturbation, it comes from two different Latin words. Manus, meaning hand, and stuprar, meaning defilement. It literally translates to self-defilement, self-abuse, or self-rape. There is nothing wrong with the practice of playing with our genitals solely for the sake of pleasuring ourselves, but there is still too much anxiety and stigma built into the practice. Things don't change unless we change the language we use to discuss them. It's no wonder it remains an embarrassing act that makes people uncomfortable to discuss it if the official word we use to describe the act basically means that we are harming or degrading ourselves if we engage in it. That is why I am calling for an end to this word and will no longer use it myself. I haven't decided what word to begin using in its place. Maybe mundesui, which is Latin for self-cleanse, or curamsui, self-care, or Amor sui, self-love. I don't know. I want to open it up to our listeners to see what they think the new official word or term should be to describe this act. Reach out to us on social media, email us, or call and leave a message at 775-387-2278, which is 775-DTPcast, and tell us what you think. We'll take the best submissions and then put it to a public vote. If we bring enough people on board and start using the new and approved phrase, we can begin to change the language around this 100% natural, healthy thing that everyone does and begin to end the shame, humiliation, and outdated beliefs that still shadow this practice. We're going to end it here. And here's what I want you to do. Right now, After you're done listening to this, go touch yourself. If you're in a safe location and situation to do so, I don't want you blaming me if you cause a car accident or get arrested for public indecency, but go play with yourself. And when it starts feeling really fucking good, think to yourself, what describes this sensation? What word or phrase or saying can encompass how good this feels and how amazing it is? I'm counting on you to do that for me and let me know. Take care for now and happy rubbing.